How else has AI been changing the way that you think about your work? It's everything. It's total. If AI isn't involved in what I'm thinking about, then I don't think about it. I look at the strikes in Hollywood. The disruption that's happening or is about to happen between now and 2025 is so significant. Hollywood in general is just sound asleep at the wheel, driving off of a cliff. Hi, I'm Boaz, CEO and founder of Simply Augmented, and I'm thrilled to have you join in today to the Shift AI podcast. In today's episode, I'm thrilled to have Neil Mant on the show. Neil is a five-time Emmy Award winner and a pioneer in the VR, AR, and AI space in Hollywood. If you're someone interested in the way that AI is filtering into the entertainment business and in the studio environment in Hollywood, you're not going to want to miss this episode. It's great to have Neil on the podcast, and I can't wait to learn more. Let's get to it. Neil, welcome to the Shift AI podcast. It's great to have you on. Thank you for having me. I am really, really excited to talk with you today. I uh, I got to be honest with you. I was looking at your background. I always like to start the show giving people a sense of of the kind of things that the guests have done. I, I usually read that back. And I mean, you are really, really interesting background. Five-time Emmy-winning producer. You've got thousands of episodes of network television, films. Uh, you're a Clio Award winner. I know that you've been early in augmented reality. Also, the stuff you're doing with Crime Door and in, in AI, I think, is something that we're going to want to talk about. The first to produce the Super Bowl in VR, O.J. Simpson, Criminal Trial, and the, the list goes on. But there's a couple things about your background that I would love to hear about. And I was just really wondering about this. You had a former opening act for Run DMC. Can you tell us about that? Um, so 1984, I was living in Detroit and I, um, I got into breakdancing. As a teenager, I was 14 and, um, and there was a competition in Detroit for people who would be the opening act for Run DMC. And it was their first tour. Um, and it was in May, I think it was, of 1984. And I was <laughs> the opening act at the Fox Theater. That's you know, amazing. A thousand people. And I was out there with my little breakdancing troupe, the Renegade Breakers. Here's the other thing that I heard, too. I heard that you have a, something in the Guinness Book of World Records. What is that all about? So I'm I, I'm a content guy, and I've I've been creating content since I was a teenager. I started thinking about mobile video. YouTube had really just become a thing. They weren't monetizing yet. There really wasn't a lot of monetization opportunities for um, web content yet. And I, I and I love niche programming. So a friend of mine, Heather Patron, and I were sort of brainstorming on ways we could make inexpensive content okay. at volume and make some money. And, and I just kept thinking about niche programming. And I realized that every newspaper in America has horoscopes. And so I went to NBC Universal, which owned a thing called iVillage at the time. That was kind of their, their catch all for NBC content. And, um, they had bought recently astrology.com and they didn't have any video content of any kind. And so I went to them and I said, look, I think that we could do daily horoscopes and, um, and would you be interested in taking that content? And it'll be free. You don't have to pay anything. We'll just split it 50-50. You do the ad sales because you have the ad sales yeah. department. We'll make the content. And you know what you don't think about is that the stars are predictable. You know, Right now, you could go to the bookstore for the few bookstores that ex exist, and you could buy a book you know, of next year's horoscopes. Yeah. And it would be all written. And so I said to Heather, let's just take a month. And we'll rewrite them, but we'll write them with sort of a, a love angle. We'll call it love horoscopes. And it'll just be like two, three sentences. Hey, Aquarius, you know, moon's in retrograde or you know, whatever. Uh, Hor uh, Heather did all the horoscope work. I just did the deal and I put it together. Yeah. We set up a green screen in my studio. It was a studio in Hollywood and wrote a month's worth of them and, and shot them and edited them, put little graphics, bookending it. And then went to astrology.com again and said, look, we did a month every day and we shot them in, I don't know, like three days. And they said, all right, let's do it. And so then we knocked out the whole year in about a month and a half. Oh, and wow. we, did that for, we did that for multiple years. And with, the, with Guinness, you can go to them and you can create a new category if they don't have it. And so I said, you know, let's create one for most video horoscopes. And I think we did like 18,000 video oh, horoscopes. God, and that's, that's a ton. That's the record. And I, I think I have another one. I don't know if it, it was finalized, but I, I did a stunt in Times Square 
where I had a, a, a circus performer balance on a chair on a high wire for the entire day. And while it was happening, he was doing <laughs> interviews on like Good Morning America and Telemundo and local news stations. And that's the longest someone balanced on a high wire on a chair. Wow. So. That's pretty cool. That's pretty wild. Well, I know I ran through that intro, but is there anything that I missed that you want to highlight to of some of the things that you've done? No, I mean, I mean, I guess the basic story about me is I've been a content person since I was a kid. I started as an actor in local commercials in Detroit when I was 10. I won the National College Emmy for a, a public access show I had as a teenager. I was interviewing rock stars in Detroit. Um, this was in the mid 80s, years before Wayne's World. It was like 1986, 87, yeah. 88. Um, remember that movie Almost Famous where that guy went on yeah. a kid went on tour for like a month or a couple of weeks with a band? Yeah, totally. Like, with 50 bands. <laughs> um, teenager. And so I had a lot of fun. I mean, I'm, you know, shotgunning beers with Billy Idol <laughs> um, and more. So, yeah. And then I just moved into, you know, news and television and creating shows. I'm just always kind of moving yeah. forward in Hollywood and, and just really doing what I want to do. You know, this show is about the future of work, but I like to understand where people are coming from and what their identity is related to work. And I always like to know what the, what was your first job that you actually got paid? I think it was my first commercial. I mean, I, you know, I, I shoveled snow and I mowed lawns, Yeah. but I was, I, I feel like I started those businesses. I mean, I was probably shoveling snow when I was like eight. My mom was like, get out there and make a buck. But when I was 10, I, I, I stumbled my way onto a movie set uh, for a TV movie in Detroit. And I just started yelling at people. I'm like, who's in charge here? Who's in charge? And it landed me with the producer, Alex Karras. And then he introduced me to the casting director. And then a few weeks later, I, I had a commercial when I was 10. So wow. that may have been the first 10 years like, old, 10 years old. Yeah. And by 11, I was commuting to New York City from Detroit alone. I fly to New Jersey to Newark. I take the bus in the Port Authority, walk down 42nd Street, which in 1980 was not a nice place. But my parents were from New York and they were obviously maniacs. Uh, to let me do such a thing. Tell me about your parents. I, was there production in your background? Were they in the business? How did you get into this so young? No, they. I mean, I got into it because I, I always knew, always as a kid, that this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to be in entertainment and media and creating content. My, no, my mom was a nurse, ended up teaching the master's of nursing program at University of Detroit. And my dad was um, head of personnel for a life insurance company. They had no interest or understanding of media in any way, which is interesting because as we sort of look at the story play out, not only have I had this long career in media, but I've been partners with my brother, who's a producer and a director since 2000, I think, 2001. And and he's a multi-Emmy winner on his own. Um, and separate of my work with him together, he has a lar long background in sports. He worked for NBA, NFL. He's currently working for, um, at Major League Baseball. He's currently working for Live Golf. And oh, wow. my sister who passed a couple of years ago, she went on to become a multi-Emmy winner and she was the executive producer of the SB Awards for a number of years. Man, it's so, in the family. Three kids out of Detroit with no background in media all went on to be fairly successful in media, which is That's odd. incredible, yeah. Well, last time, we, we were uh, in LA together last week and we were talking and you were telling me about your background in VR, augmented reality, and now in AI. So talk to me yeah. a little bit about some of the projects that you're working on now that are firing you up. It, it first, it started for me around 2010. I had seen the smartphone, I'd seen the internet, and each time I wasn't really a technical person. And I, I promised myself that when the next sort of iteration of the internet and of content was to come around, I would be there in the beginning. And so in 2010, 2011, I could feel what is now known as cord cutting, where people were leaving cable and, and it just was getting harder and harder for me to sell a series. I'd make a sizzle reel or in a pitch deck and the network executive would be like, oh, just one more thing. Let's change that one more time. And previously, I mean, in the early part of my career of selling TV shows, I could just walk in the room with an idea and, and it was good. I mean, I'm a very good salesperson. I'm really good at pitching yeah. and I understand production very well and I can do things on a budget. So I was able to have success in that and here suddenly... 10, 11, I was like, this, this has changed dramatically. And so rather than just wait to be run over by a truck, I said, all right, I need to think differently. And so I was on high alert for whatever would become the next thing. And so in 2014, when Oculus was bought by Zuckerberg, I said, this is it. And I'm in. Yeah. And 
And I started making content in 2015 uh, in VR. And, and I got some good clients because I learned spherical storytelling very fast. And my competitors were primarily tech people that didn't understand story. Sure. So I became the official company of IndyCar, college football playoff. I produced a Super Bowl in VR, uh, did stuff for Coca-Cola, Wendy's. I mean, I did a live New Year's Eve for Fox News and created some technology. And I was starting to use AI in that time period. You know, I was just thinking, how can I use AI? How can I be on the next frontier? And in 2019, I had really been trying to think about what what that would look like. And I realized that there was no home base as an app or even as a website for true crime content. And mm -hmm. true crime is the most consumed content globally by a mile. People think it's sports. It is not. 30% of a newscast, if it wants to be successful, needs to be negative crime stuff. Nobody on the planet needs an explanation as to what a murder or missing person is, whereas the NFL is not widely known globally. Virtually nobody in India knows what the NFL is. And nobody in the United States knows what Indian Cricket League is. But everybody knows OJ Simpson. Yeah. And so the, the cases are larger than, than anything that happens in sports. Uh, so I, I saw that no one had built sort of an ESPN, and I, and I use that as just a kind of a home base for something. And so my wife and I discussed it, and we said, all right, we can make a true crime platform that would, uh, in a mobile situation, would, be, would have uh, augmented reality portals where you could use your phone and you could open up a portal and walk it. into it. We would rebuild the actual crime scene in three dimensions using CGI, which obviously all of this has AI baked in, into it, yeah. um, and, and have interactivity, and it wouldn't need goggles. You could use a phone to do it. While at the same time, we were future-proofing ourselves. So when the Apple Glasses come out, we could then move this three-dimensional content right into there. And we have dozens of scenes that we will do there, do that, and it'll be on, on day one. Uh, we'll be on those glasses. And so then we started thinking, okay, well, now Chad GPT is out. How can we use that to reinvent Crime Door since we're going to move the portal stuff onto the Apple device? And we said, all right, well, why don't we create something that hunts the internet on a daily basis? We set up a specific amount of categories. So like police and breaking news, of course, international violent crime, celebrity. And yeah. so just like any news app you would look at, whether it's CNN or Fox News or Newsbreak or News Nation or whatever, you could see these categories in the top and you just tap a category and it has a feed of news stories that the AI goes to the internet and it finds them and then it rewrites them into a shorter form story. And then I have two people who then go in and polish those stories. Mm -hmm. So AI identifies what's trending and then it gives us a framework of a story. And then a human comes in and rewrites and polishes that story. That's cool. That's really cool. How else has AI been changing the way that you think about your work, both in terms of the production, also in the delivery and the deliverables? It's everything. It's total if AI isn't involved in what I'm thinking about, then I don't think about, it. you know, I, I look at the strikes in Hollywood, you know, the disruption that's happening or is, a, is about to happen between now and I think 2025 is so significant. And Hollywood in general is just sound asleep at the wheel, driving off of a cliff. You know, there's a lot of arrogance in Hollywood that we can just keep doing the things the way that they want to do. But you know, just to sort of give you some examples of, of yeah, a lot of things that will happen. So one of the big concerns is, I'm a, let's say I'm an actor, and that actor, you know, he goes to a TV show, is hired out to be a player in the show, and I do one episode, and then they scan me, and and then you know they want to use me for the rest of the series, or you know, on and on and on. So as yeah. an actor, I would say, well, wait a minute here, can you do this? And am I going to get paid for the residuals moving forward per episode? I mean, what about day rates and shooting? Sure. These are real questions for sure uh, to be asked. And the reality of it is they will work one day. They will be scanned mm -hmm. and they will not work moving forward. Now, is there a negotiation to be had on, as to what that day rate will be? Of course there is. Yeah. Is there ongoing royalty that could happen as a result of this? Of course that could happen. But will they get paid for day rates moving forward? They will not. Uh, whatever they make, it will be less and the business will just have changed and it, it, you will have a choice. Do you want to be a series character in this series and work one day, but still have that reputation as doing it? Yeah. Uh, 
or not. And the or not will mean that they're going to get somebody else, which right. is going to put the union in complete jeopardy moving forward. And I don't know what that future of the union looks like. In the situation of a writer, you right now, Writers Guild uh, workers on certain kinds of shows, so let's say a scripted show. And if it's a one hour scripted show, there's a rule that says you must have, I don't know, eight or 10 writers in the writer's room. Typically, the way that works is a writer will, one person will write the script for this week, and then the other people will get in the room and they'll polish it throughout the week. Yeah. Well, you won't need a requirement of eight people. Wouldn't one person could do it with the AI, or maybe you have two or three people that are producers on the show and writers, and they're creatively doing that. Yeah. So that, that just will happen. Think about editors. You know, I've produced a lot of reality shows in my career. Imagine if I'm producing a, a, a new version of a housewife type show. Okay. Uh, if I'm doing a housewife type show, I'm setting up GoPros in their houses. I got a camera crew of eight to 12 people, depending upon if it's a, if it's a big shoot. I may shoot between all the footage, several thousand hours worth of content. To go through yeah. a thousand hours, it takes a thousand hours at least. And then to make notes and to trim it down. This is being done by people who are either editors or story producers who are probably not covered by unions in most of the reality space. Certainly the story producers are not. They are, in fact, actually editors slash writers, and neither the Editors Guild nor the Writers Guild protects anybody in the reality business, which it, mm. it's its own thing that they've missed out on, A, monetizing with this group of people and or protecting them for over 20 years, the reality business has been going on for quite a while now. You could imagine a scenario where I take all housewife shows in every format ever created, put it into a computer, take my thousand hours of footage, put it into a computer, and just tell the program, duplicate the other shows and give me music, give me an edit, and make sure. it consistent with the other shows. And then one editor goes in there and polishes the actual cuts. This is within two, three years. Yeah. What is your feeling about what's happening with the writer's strike right now? And what's your position on it? Do you have a position that, that you can share? It, it just feels like the, the conversation that's being had right now is something that computers are, are going to be able to do. And the executives probably know that. Well, first and foremost, not naming any names, but I can tell you that I don't think anybody in any of those rooms knows what they're talking about. I don't think they have, as it relates to AI, I think they have absolutely no concept. They have concepts of things but no practical understanding of how it works or how it's done sure. uh, for a number of reasons. One is it's so early. It's incredibly early. And a lot of this is theory. And I'm giving you theory as to what will happen, but I'm basing it on logic and the edited video I get in my Apple phone every day. That's like, here's your memories of a, a trip where it edits it on its own. And it usually picks the pretty good photos. So it doesn't take a genius to be able to extrapolate what will happen. So in my mind, what I would think is, again, these are real issues. And I think that at the end of the day, there will be disruption to the writers and to the actors and anybody who's representative in, in these guilds. I don't think there's any way to avoid it. I think business is business. Uh, these are companies that are going to make money. I think that as we saw from YouTube and TikTok and Instagram, there is a enormous group of creators globally who are ready to rock oh, and yeah. roll. Uh, and those who don't even know about it yet are going to suddenly in one, two, three years, get tools that it's just entirely voice activated. They just simply have to describe what they want and it'll make full, not only, you know, scenes and stories, but it will make them spatially in 3d, which is a whole different thing that yeah. people aren't considering. But I think what should happen like now and in, in the future strikes, which are inevitable, I would say separate these two ideas. I, I think you have AI and then everything else. And I think the everything else, there is common ground that could happen and you could get to a solution. And I think the AI should be punted. I would say they should hire, you know, make a blue ribbon panel with you and me on it and <laughs> some other people who have actually yeah. touched AI and have made content and give them a six month period of time, all independent to just sort of make recommendations. This is what's going to happen to yeah. content. This is, this is real. It's a matter of fact that writers and actors, you cannot get what you had. Just like IBM can't bring back the typewriter. It's just yeah. done, over. And then after a six-month period of time, then you come back to the table and finish the negotiation on the AI. And if they really want to yeah. make it stick, some of these recommendations should be required to adopt. 
because the, you know there's there's just no winning on the creative side as it exists now but there's winning on the creative side of again the, the future like the youtubes of the world where everybody can be creators that yeah. writer who didn't have access to becoming a director well now that person could become a director the actor that couldn't get cast in a role can make the role and can make the content so I see a flood of new, amazing content on the horizon, which is going to disrupt the studio system at a whole different level. So mm -hmm. they're all about to be find themselves in a whole pile of hurt, and, and they're not thinking about it the right way and how fast it's going to happen. I love the task force idea. and I mean, it's clearly the power dynamics in Hollywood are going to change. And I know you've been thinking a lot about that, too. We had a discussion about... Uh, the power dynamics in Hollywood and studios in particular. And I know also that you are doing some online courses right now, which is a good segue to that project, which mm -hmm. is helping people understand what that ecosystem even looks like. Can you talk a little bit about that and kind of with the overall conceptual framework of, of the AI and, and all that's happening right now? So uh, first of all, I, I love to help. I feel, and, and my brother and my sister, uh, big helpers. It, it, it benefits everyone else's success is my success in some way through either karma. I mean, so many things have happened to me that have been great in my life. And I have no doubt it's some karma because I'm good. I don't lie. I help people. And, and there's just been a limitation as to how much I could do throughout my career, even though I've mentored hundreds and employed many, many thousands in my career. I wanted to eventually get to a point where I had done enough, where I have a much enough of a diverse background, where I could share in a course that would be basically, here's how to make it in the entertainment business from how to enter into it, how to think about all the niche, niche things, whether it's what kind of corporation do you set up? Are you a loan out? Are you an LLC? Are you raising capital? Are you a C Corp, S Corp? To how do I pitch? How do I ideate? What materials do I need to get in the room? How do I get in that room? How do I turn a no into a yes? Mm -hmm. And so it's this very big project. It's about 130 videos that are short form from three to 15 minutes. And it's about 13 hours of content, I think, now. Wow. It's pretty comprehensive. And if you, if you thought of a college course and a semester of college, when you really break down, the, you took out like the students asking questions and back and forth, the teacher is probably talking for about 13 hours in a semester. Mm -hmm. and, and so this is really equivalent to a, a college course in that sense. But from the people who have taken it so far, they've said it was a college degree for them. Baked within this course is a, a large section that talks about what's next, which is first and foremost, AI. And that is totally coupled with three-dimensional spatial media. What we'll see in the new glasses from Apple, and eventually there'll be, you know, consumer level glasses walking the streets. And then you get into a whole different world of the, the entire world becoming a canvas for content and a canvas for being gamified continuously. The multimodal conversation is an interesting one. I mean, we've experienced it this year with text to image with Dali and, you know, people are really, really excited about that. The text to video is just coming on. It seems like a lot of that stuff is really early compared with all the ChatGPT stuff that we've been seeing uh, this last six months, text to 3D is really, really interesting. Can you talk a little bit about that? I, I know that you are thinking about that in a way that is a little bit different. A 3D multimodal AI, I think is going to be huge, especially with Vision Pro and what Apple's thinking about. Well, I, I think we sort of need to start with understanding what kind of 3D we're talking about. Endless people are like, oh, I don't like 3D movies. I don't like the glasses. I don't like the way, you know, it's gimmicky. Things just jump out at me. Forget that. It doesn't matter to me if you had VR in 2015 and you vomited all over your living room. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> it's not what the future is going to be. And so we should all sort of get rid of our baggage, embrace humility, because things are about to go bonkers. When you think about what spatial content is, this is something where you could have what's called six degrees of freedom. You can't walk around in a 3D movie. That's just stuff that's like that's just things stabbing at you, that's jumping out at you. It's very yeah. different. Furthermore, there are things called haptics. That mm -hmm. haptic is your connection with the technology. We also may know this from a car. Some cars, if you're driving the car and you start to veer off the road, it'll yeah. vibrate and bring you back in. That's, that's haptic, letting you know that you connect with technology. Well, just matter of fact, haptic clothing has been around for a while. There's a, uh, I've tried this gaming suit you can wear. And if you were to 
play you know first person shooter game with me and you were to sort of shoot at me, I would feel a, an air depression on my chest that feels like I was pressed against and that you know, represents the bullet. Yeah. Of course, that'll be more intense over time. Gloves. So in, in a spatial existence where I'm wearing the Apple glasses and this new three-dimensional spatial FaceTime, which is coming soon, you could essentially hug somebody from across the world and have the sense of them being present in your space wow. and persistently anchored in your space. Those are key words, persistent and presence. So now if you take it to the next level, which is of a conversion rate for money, there are um, augmented reality features that are spatial right now in apps like Ikea or Wayfair or Oliver Peoples, where I could yeah. put glasses on or I could put a chair in the corner. And it's something of the effect of I'm 45% more likely to buy that chair if I had it in my living room and I experienced it. When you see something and you experience it in your space three-dimensionally, your brain activates a different process, which results in understanding. It is literally impossible to understand something if you read it. You have to experience it to understand it. Yeah. So now I understand the couch in my space. I understand how the color matches. I understand it. I post it on the internet. People validate me. They're like, oh my God, your couch is so great and your your room is so great and you're so great. Like, like, like. And I just feel yeah. better about myself when I buy the couch and I'm over 90% less likely to return it. You're going to see experiential content that will convert to sales, which makes money, which will keep people further engaged through interactivity. And the, that kind of media is going to be able to be created just by talking to it. You'll be able to just describe the scene. And we're already at that place now where, as you pointed out, you can do it two-dimensionally by texting yeah. on the computer, or we all believe in voice. So I could just use voice that's already here. And so you're going to see all kinds of new creators. And this is what's going to disrupt Hollywood at a whole different level because there's people sitting in their basement eating Cheetos right now that are going to gravitate to this when it becomes easy to use. So there are all these global creators that don't know they're about to become superstars tomorrow or in six months or a year or two years and will be able to create feature films and television series just by oh, yeah. verbalizing creativity. I think the creation of scenes with AI is going to be something that we always knew that that took a lot of labor. And it was really hard yeah. to do. Think about all the people in Unity and Unreal spending a lot of time in those programs, right? Being yeah. able to text and voice to 3D and instantly create environments that you can occupy with your friends, or it becomes a backdrop to your movie. We're going to see that all day long. I'm, I'm positive of it. Of course. It just, it, it logically makes sense. And we, we don't have to make a big leap because the primers already exist. They're all already there. There's a, a, uh, a version of Seinfeld in a very pixelated animated version that an AI is creating 24 seven. Are you familiar with this? Yeah. I've heard about this. Yeah. yeah and tell, it's, tell the audience a little bit about it. I, I don't think a lot of people know about this there and it's not the only one, but, and this is a couple of years old now. This is not based on chat GPT. This has been around for a minute. I mean, maybe a year and a half, two years old. I'm not sure. It's generating its own sitcom. It's very pixelated. And you see the characters and they are basically going through the process of every 30 minutes. It creates a show 24-7. That will become better animation soon. And, and it will be photorealistic in video soon mm -hmm. after that. And it will become spatial in, it, in a different form. And, and spatial content is not going to eliminate the two-dimensional content. We'll still have movies. We'll still have television shows, just like we still have radio and we still have theater. Um, but it will it will evolve and it will be its own thing very, very soon. That's exciting. Well, you touched on this before. You said that you've been a mentor to a lot of folks over the years. Who was a mentor to you? Oh. Who, are the, who are the people in your past that you think about that really had an impact on your career? Endless. I mean, I've sought out mentors since I was a kid. There's just so many people... Many in the television space. There's a guy who's a president of WME IMG, Mark Shapiro. He and I connected when his career was rocketing. And he is super smart and super creative and has just been so inspiring to me. And he's been a mentor, even though we're, we're really the same age. The same network, ESPN, Steve Bornstein, who ran the network back then. Uh, also a a major influence and a supporter of mine over the years. I, I often go for people who aren't in media that names you wouldn't know. 
I look for people in their 70s, even 80s, who are retired from business, having grown up in Detroit. I knew many yeah. people in the automotive industry who were senior leaders. So I'm, I'm always on the hunt, even today, for more and more mentors. I'm finding mentors for me who are younger than me, mm-hmm. who think of things differently than I do. Uh, so the, the education process, the mentorship process is total for me. So as you look into the future, what do you think, what are you seeing out there as the emerging technology that you're the most excited about next five to 10 years? Well, it's AI. I mean, it's a hundred percent. It's AI. But for me, I think about what the AI will do and how it will be utilized. So let's, let's think about in, in the real world, because I'm, I've always been fascinated with augmented reality. And I think about, well, how will that actually play out? And let's, yeah. again, stay in the logical world. So we are going to move to a scenario where we're wearing glasses. And I don't care who says they're not. They're wrong. You, you already have augmented reality devices where we all have ear pods or earbuds and, or a cable thing that's augmenting your reality. Mm-hmm. If I had told people, I told you 25 years ago that you'd walk around with your face down all the time, your neck bent over, not talking to people, you would have said I was crazy. Well, yep. that's where we are. We will move away from that. It will seem comically old school when we move to AR glasses and, or contact lenses. Mojo Vision, by example, oh, yeah. is a company with contact lenses and has for many years. And so when we move to uh, wearables that are vision based, we will move to be upright again. And that will be a whole different experience that humanity hasn't had in many, many years. We will be more social because obviously we will be able to learn more about people instantaneously. The lenses on the outside of the glasses will, of course, recognize your face and your LinkedIn profile, your Facebook profile, or whatever app that I choose to activate on my lenses will scan your face. Obviously, we believe in facial recognition, right? And it, it won't be a situation where you just put the glasses on and you'll see nonsense everywhere. That won't happen. It will be app-based, just like the phone is, the phone, the TV, nothing just happens. You have to select something. And so it'll just change the company that's there. But this stuff will take place in the real world. And so this now brings up another uh, process and thought that I that is always on my mind that I've been working on, which is intellectual property rights in a 3D situation. Hmm, and, tell me more about that. Well, I mean, let's, let's, let's go from a social perspective first. So you and I, we had, let's say the other day, we were hanging out, right? We took that photo of each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We take a photo, we took a photo, right? Yeah. The group. Mm-hmm. Okay. So let's say I took a photo of the two of us and, and I'm like, oh, wow, we look great. I'm going to post this right now. And then I get distracted. And five years from now, I'm in the Serengeti on a safari and my daily photo reminders pop up and it shows the photo and it, it will ask me two things right away. Cause I'm like, I'm ready to post this now. I forgot. So yeah. that was a life miss. I better fix it today. <laughs> Gotta have it on my social media. And it will ask me, it'll say, do you want to tag? And do you want to tag the location? And mm-hmm. do you want to tag everybody that was in the group? Provided we're connected on Facebook or whatever yeah. platform I'm putting it on. Well, even though I'm in it five years later in a foreign country, it knows who was a part of that and knows where it took place. It doesn't say, do you want to tag the Serengeti? Which right. means that underlying information still exists at that restaurant. And so go ahead, three, four, five, six, seven years, whatever, when we're wearing glasses and it's, it's all come together and I activate Facebook and I walk into that restaurant, and I say, populate friends. The photo would exist there because my camera today has two lenses on it. This yep. is a, th- a three-dimensional image. The artificial intelligence predictive can guess what the background is. So we will exist there spatially, and I could walk around. I could see it. As the bandwidth opens up more, it will capture a video of the whole experience for me to discover. I could put it private so other people couldn't see it, or I could leave it public. And you'll see influencers like the Kardashians or new influencers be paid to tag themselves and talk at restaurants and experience yeah. it in a different manner. And you'll also see the opportunity to put media in the real world. So if, if we're not breadcrumbing, yeah. If we're not looking at our phone where we're personalized getting ads, you know, you get different ads than I get. If we're not doing that anymore, how will Facebook make money? Well, we need to put the ads in the real world. And I realized this in 2016 and I thought, well, you can't put an ad in my building. 
And at the same time, I looked at Pokemon and I said, you know, Pokemon's a crime. There has never been a moment in the history of time when you could walk onto someone's private property and set up a for-profit business and not tell the property owner, much less give them an insurance certificate. But that's yeah. exactly the business model of Pokemon. And they have been litigated. They have lost. They have a form on their website that you can fill out to remove the Pokemon. But it's in a situation now where you are forced to find a way to opt out. Like email in the beginning was all spam. They're essentially spamming the real world, but monetizing people. And so mm -hmm. that that's going to end. And I'm hoping to be the guy who puts it to an end. And so if you could have Pokemon on a property, not only could you have Grand Theft Auto on a property, and then you can have security guards shooting people because they look like they're playing some kind of first-person shooter game. Yeah. But you could put an ad on the building. And if it's if you and I are seeing different ads all the time now, well, then the world could be covered with limitless ads individually sold to hit you know each one of us separately. So yeah. now you have a building's intellectual property rights that haven't been accounted for. And real estate is a slow business to to adjust to these things. So for since 2017, 16, I've been talking to property owners and saying, you know, there's a, a way that you will be able to soon monetize. But in the interim, you should be protecting your assets from violation before it becomes the norm. And, you know, you get in front of some judge with a lawsuit in 2028 and you say, you know, there's this asset on my building that's talking to people on the street and selling them drugs or other yeah. things that confusing the public and collecting money and data. And, you know, real estate, it's, it's fundamental value is based on a single word, which is trust. There's never been a moment in the history of time where someone bought a piece of property and looked around and said, oh, my God, this is the worst neighborhood in the world. I hope it gets worse. That's <laughs> not what you think. And just like we may uh, go into a neighborhood now, and if it was dirty or it had graffiti, you know, we may be concerned with the neighborhood in some capacity. And yeah. if the world is covered in digital misleading graffiti, that could drop the value of real estate assets immediately. So what are you and, coaching uh, real estate property owners on? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm basically a guy who's like the, someone in the 80s that went around and, uh, and went to people who own property and said, look, there's a future coming. Mm -hmm. And in that future, uh, people are going to need to have cell phones and they're going to need places to put cell towers. Let me be your representative to uh, be there when that happens. And so I've been working with property owners to organize and get their rights in a position so that they can monetize where they can get rid of the violators. That company is called Digital Rights Management. I have a website called drm.la. People can sign up to get protected. It costs no money. And again, this is, this is micro transactions, but yeah. at volume, Instagram will make a fortune or anyone who's collecting those rights, which hopefully yep. where I'm paying, <laughs> and I will create an environment where these transactions can take place. That's fascinating. So before I forget, Will you let people know in the audience how to get into the courses that you're putting out there? Yeah. So my name is Neil Mant, N-E-I-L-M-A-N-D-T. And my website is neilmant.com. And that's where you get access to my content. All right. I'm going to end the show with a question that I end all shows with. And if you're going to describe the future of work, the future of entertainment in two words, what would those two words be? And then you can elaborate. That's a good question. Two words. I'm an optimist. Let's just start with that. Okay. There are people who would say destructive disruption. I don't think that way. I say big opportunity. Big opportunity. Okay. Tell me more. Because it will give people tools to do things that are superpowers. Things that would have cost in, in the entertainment business would have cost a lot of money and require a lot of manpower to create something that a single individual can just talk into a program and create something that would have cost a fortune and had all kinds of other situations involved. We had to get locations and, and equipment and all these things. The biggest of biggest of biggest opportunities is what AI is going to bring to the table. I love it. Big opportunity. Neil, it was so fun having you on the show. Thank you for taking the time. Really a pleasure. It's been so much fun. I really appreciate you having me on the show. Okay, that's a wrap. It was really great to have Neil on the podcast today. His experience in AR, VR, and AI, and the way that Hollywood works was really interesting. If you want to learn more about Neil, please follow him on LinkedIn and Twitter, and you can go to neilmant.com to download his coursework and learn more about the way he thinks about Hollywood and the entertainment business. 
I continue to be amazed by the guests that we've had on the show, and I'm super excited about the interviews that we have in the future. As always, the Shift AI podcast is brought to you by Simply Augmented, and the theme music is by Dave Angel.